my first slide there full screen. Um, yes, yeah. we can. Fantastic. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about uh, application for a transform of medical imaging. Um, I'm aware that you're probably from a, a range of backgrounds, so some of this may be things that you already know, and some of it may be things that, that you, you don't know. So um, I tried to strike the balance somewhere in between, so there's something for everybody. Um, so I'm going to start uh, by a quick recap of a uh, Taylor series, Fourier series, and, and what we mean by a Fourier transform. Uh, there's very little maths, uh, so hopefully this is just a refresher for you. Uh, and then the second half, I'm going to talk mainly about the application of uh, Fourier transforms to my area of interest, which is magnetic resonance imaging. Um, I realise you've got some uh, other lectures on this during the course, um, so I'm specifically going to focus on the Fourier transform side of MRI. Uh, and then touch a little bit about uh, wider digital imaging um, used in medicine, uh, where Fourier transforms can be of interest. So just to go back to the beginning, just to remind you what a Taylor series is, uh, we express a function as a sum of uh, polynomials. Uh, and the higher order of polynomials, the more terms we have, the better the approximation the Taylor series is to the function that we're interested in. So for example, if we wanted to look at the Taylor series of a sine wave, so we've got the sine wave in red on the screen here, uh, our first approximation could be a straight line. That's gonna fit uh, the, the, the zero part of the sine wave quite nicely, but obviously it's not fitting the curves very well. Uh, so our function, our Taylor series could start with the linear term. Uh, we can add in higher order terms, so here we've got an x cubed term, uh, and that cubic curve starts to fit the sine wave better, uh, but it's, 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 it's still not so good further away. And then we can add in higher order terms, there's x to the power 5, uh, and when we add those all together, we start to get a better approximation uh, of the sine wave. And we can do that for any function, and the more terms we had, the better approximation we have. So this is our Taylor series and we can go on and on uh, with, with, with more terms. Uh, so here's an animation of this, which I hope is, is, is the same as the last slide really, but I think an animation uh, adds to it here. So at uh, the bottom of the animation, hopefully you can see uh, it's approximating uh, sine x with a function that starts with a linear term x, then a, a cubic term, then x to the power five, x to the power seven, uh, and so on. And the higher order terms we get, the better uh, the Taylor series fits the curve that we're interested in, in this case, the sine wave. Um, so that's a Taylor series, and that's a, a series of polynomials. With the Fourier series, we effectively do the same thing, except the function is now a sum of sinusoids. So that's a sum of sine and cosine waves. Uh, and, and, and again, the higher order terms we have, the better approximation we have to the function that we're interested in. Uh, so here's our first order term. So uh, the function, the approximate function that we're interested in equals a constant uh, plus a cosine term and then plus a sine term. So that's our, our first uh, order term. Uh, and then we add in a cosine and a sine wave at twice the frequency, so two times x uh, for both the co cosine and the sine. And then the next order term will be three times the frequency, three times x, and so on. And we keep adding in more and more terms, higher order terms. Um, but unlike the power series, this is a continuous series, um, and it's worth rem reminding ourselves that the, the first term here, where we've just got cos x and sine x, this is a low frequency uh, sinusoid wave, whereas the higher order terms, in this case where we've got cos 5x, sine 5x, this is higher frequencies. So we've got a sum here, so our function is a sum of a linear term plus low order frequencies plus higher order frequencies going higher and higher and higher order frequencies. And the more terms we put in, the more higher order frequencies we're adding in. And obviously we've got these coefficients, A and B, which are the weightings as to how much we weight this sum towards the lower frequencies or the higher frequencies. So here's an example. Uh, we've got a, a low frequency uh, sinusoid here. Uh, so that would give us a term uh, We've got a low frequency, so we've got frequency here on the horizontal axis, amplitude on the vertical axis, uh, and this plot here is showing us that we have uh, a sine sinusoid with a low frequency and fairly high amplitude. Uh, here we have a sinusoid with a, a, a higher frequency, um, so we would display that in the Fourier series uh, as being uh, at a higher frequency, so further to the right on the horizontal axis. And here's a sinusoid with much higher frequency, 
And again, that would be displayed uh, further to the right on the axis here because it's a higher frequency. Um, so, the, so that's fine, that's all fairly straightforward. Of course, the nice thing with the Fourier series and of course the Fourier transform is, um, is that uh, we can consider uh, the combination of different waves. So in this case, we've got two waves uh, that we're detecting. Uh, we have an, a wave with a fairly low frequency but a high amplitude, uh, and then a, a wave with a higher frequency and a fairly low amplitude. So those two waves added together might look something like this. This is not the exact result, this is, this is just an example. Uh, so when we add two waves together, we get a beat frequency and we get a combined wave uh, that looks quite complicated like this. Um, so if we're detecting this, we may, uh, from whatever experiment we're detecting this from, we may want to know what the frequency components are in that more complex wave. Uh, so what we do is we uh, calculate the Fourier series or the Fourier transform of that wave, and it tells us that this compound wave that we're detecting has two sinusoids in it, uh, one with a medium frequency and a high amplitude, and one with a high frequency uh, and, a, and a lower amplitude. So the Fourier, by calculating the Fourier series or the Fourier transform, we've effectively worked out what the components are in terms of sinusoids in that compound wave that we're detecting. Okay, so the, the, the lower frequency corresponds to the, uh, the peak in the middle and the higher frequency corresponds to the peak on the right. Uh, so we can do that for almost any function. So for example, uh, let's take a square wave here. Uh, and this is a common example in Fourier transforms and Fourier series. Uh, so what if we want to try and um, work out what sines and cosines do we need to fit this square wave? Uh, so we could say, well, actually a square wave uh, is a little bit like a sine wave. It's got a, it's got a peak. Uh, and it's got a, a trough, so that's a low frequency but with a high amplitude. And then if we add in other sine waves or cosine waves, other sinusoids at different frequencies but lower amplitudes, um, they, so long as we uh, get the phase right, they'll add together constructively and we'll start to get this shape that starts to uh, better represent the square wave. And we can go on adding in higher and higher frequencies, lower amplitudes, uh, and we start to get a better representation of that uh, square wave. Uh, and here's the example with higher frequencies in still, and we've now got a, it's still clearly not a square wave, but it's a better representation of a square wave. Uh, so this is telling us that the higher frequencies um, tell us something about the sharper edges, and the lower frequencies tell us something about uh, whether we have a, a positive bright signal or a negative uh, signal here. Okay, and there's an animation that's hopefully trying to show that, show that uh, a bit clearer. So as you add in higher frequencies, uh, these red lines on the right-hand side, we get a better approximation of the function that we're trying to estimate on the right-hand side, in this case, a square wave. Uh, so again, here's another animation with higher frequencies in. As we add in higher and higher frequencies, uh, they all add up and we start to get a better approximation of that square wave. Okay, here's yet another animation from a Wikipedia page, which I think is quite good. So again, it's saying our approximation of our square wave in red is made up of a, this uh, Fourier series, this sum of these cosine and sine terms. Um, and if we sh show the individual frequencies, we've got a low frequency with a high amplitude represented by this tall bar here, and then uh, uh, low, uh, higher frequencies at lower amplitudes. So that's an example of our Fourier series. And of course, it doesn't have to be a square wave. Uh, we can do this for uh, any shape. So if we're interested in trying to find the uh, Fourier series of the blue line here, which is a quite a complicated waveform, uh, again, we can fit sinusoids to it to get a higher, better approximation. So our first order approximation is gonna be this red line here, which is a very low frequency sinusoid. Uh, and then as we add in higher frequency sinusoids, as shown in this animation, uh, we get a better and better approximation uh, to the blue waveform that we're trying to estimate. And you can see the degree is counting up there at the bottom, 22, 23. And when we get to about 25 in this case, uh, we've got high enough frequencies um, that we get a good representation of the function that we're trying to fit. Okay, so that's a Fourier series. Um, so this is the slide we saw before. Fourier series here is, um, is a sum of the uh, sine and cosines. Um, but for a Fourier series, we're increasing the frequencies in integer steps here, we're going from x to 2x to 3x to 4x to 5x. It's not a continuous range. 
Uh, so moving to a Fourier transform, we're going to do an integral of that so that we get a continuous range rather than going up in integer numbers. And then the, the other thing that to remind you of is uh, this expression here, where we can express the sum of a cosine and a sine as an exponential. Um, so the usual way that we would then write a Fourier transform is rather than adding up those terms, we're doing an integral instead. Um, so it's, it's no longer looking at um, uh, integer increases in frequency, it's now a continuous increase in frequency. So we're doing an integral over um, all the time uh, and our sine and cosine term is expressed in this exponential here. Uh, so our, the function that we, we start with is our lowercase h and we end up with the frequencies uh, of the Fourier transform is our higher case, uh, uppercase h. Uh, and just to remind you, uh, you have Fourier transform pairs. Uh, so if you, you can transform between the time uh, and the frequency space or back from the frequency space to the time space again. Okay, so we've, what about Fourier transform? So let's go back to our top hat, our square wave. Uh, if we now do the Fourier transform of that to find out what frequencies uh, are in it, we don't get uh, a graph with a bunch of sticks in uh, at uh, discrete points now. We get a continuous function, uh, which in this case is a sync function. Uh, so the Fourier transform of our top hat function gives us a sync function, which gives us a continuous range of frequencies rather than those discrete frequencies from the Fourier series. Okay, so that's our quick recap of, um, uh, of Fourier series and Fourier transforms. Um, I want to touch briefly on how uh, we can use that in uh, some medical imaging, in this case, magnetic resonance imaging. So here's a, a picture of a, a modern MRI scanner. Um, so as I said, I'm not going to explain how uh, MRI works, uh, but hopefully uh, you're already aware that um, uh, of something called a Lamour frequency, uh, where at a particular uh, magnetic field, uh, there's a particular resonant frequency uh, where you get uh, Zeeman splitting um, and resonance can occur. And we use this in MRI uh, to switch between um, energy states. So there's something called the Lamour equation, which says that our RF frequency that we use, our radio wave frequency that we use um, in MRI is directly proportional to the magnetic field strength. So it's a straightforward uh, equation of proportionality. Our RF frequency, our resonant frequency, is directly proportional to our magnetic field. And there's a constant of proportionality in there called the gyromagnetic ratio, which is constant. Um, uh, virtually all clinical imaging uh, is imaging uh, of hydrogen in water, uh, so the, uh, that gamma is a constant for uh, the protons in, in H2O in water. Um, now, to make an image, uh, we make use of Fourier transforms. Um, one of the things that we do uh, in MRI is something called frequency encoding to try and work out where our radio wave signal is coming from uh, in our patient. In this case, if we're looking at the head. Um, and although, of course, we're going to get an image of the whole head, let's just consider the water in these two eyes uh, that are blue. Uh, so our patient goes into our MRI scanner. Uh, typically, our MRI scanners are of magnetic field strength of 1.5 Tesla. So when they first go in, there's a uniform magnetic field across the uh, patient, across the head. Uh, and to build up a picture, one of the things that we do is we put on uh, a gradient magnetic field uh, across the head. So in this case, it's uh, sloping up from, um, uh, from the left-hand side up to the right-hand side. It's a linear gradient. So we can think of the equation of a straight line uh, and our gradient term. Now, what we've done there is we've deliberately perturbed the magnetic field away from being one and a half Tesla all across um, the patient's head uh, into a varying magnetic field that varies from just below one and a half Tesla on the left-hand side of the uh, uh, figure uh, up to higher than 1.5 Tesla on the right hand side of the figure. Uh, so that means from the Lamour equation, uh, our protons in the eye on the left hand side of the image uh, in this example are in 1.5 Tesla. So they have a, a resonant Lamour frequency of 64 megahertz. And the eye on the other side of the patient is also in one and a half Tesla in this case. So that those also have a resonant frequency of 64 megahertz. However, when we put our uh, magnetic field gradient on as well, we're perturbing the magnetic field. So in this case, uh, uh, the eye on the, the left-hand side of the diagram, which is the patient's right eye, is in a slightly lower magnetic field. Therefore, its resonant frequency is also slightly lower, whereas the, the protons 
in the uh, the eye on the right hand side of the image or, or the left patient's left eye is in a slightly higher magnetic field so it's a slightly higher resonant frequency uh, so in mri we detect the radio waves coming out of our patient um, and our radio waves are now going to come out of our patient with a different resonant frequency depending on where they came from left to right across the patient uh, because the protons coming from the um, the ear on the left of this diagram here are going to be in a lower magnetic field, so they're going to have a lower resonant frequency. And the radio waves coming from the ear on the right hand side of this example are in a higher magnetic field, so they're going to be emitted with a higher um, resonant frequency. So here's an example of a, the same thing on, on a body. We have a, our gradient magnetic field um, uh, going from left to right across the, 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 uh, the patient. And the radio waves coming from the arm here uh, on the, the right hand side of the figure are going to be in a higher frequency. Those coming from the arm on the left hand side are going to be at a lower frequency but of course we don't detect the individual radio waves all we detect in our antenna um, is the combined radio wave signal um, which is fine but we want to know about these individual frequencies because the individual frequencies tell us where they came from left to right across the patient so how can we find out the individual frequencies in the radio wave that we've just detected from our patient well you've guessed it we do a Fourier transform so the Fourier transform is going to tell us what range of frequencies we've got in the radio wave signal that we've just detected from our patient. And we get a graph that's starting to look familiar now, like a, a Fourier transform uh, frequency on the horizontal axis and amplitude on the vertical axis. Uh, and we get this distribution of frequencies in our radio wave signal. And I think you can see quite clearly from this diagram that what we're seeing here is a projection of uh, our patient along the x-axis. It's almost as if we've taken an x-ray uh, from, the, from the top of the patient down to the bottom and the shadow that we've got is the projection that we see in this Fourier transform. So in MRI we use Fourier transforms uh, all the time. We deliberately change the uh, magnetic field across the patient using gradient magnetic fields. This changes the, uh, uh, the frequency of the radio waves we detect. We detect the combined signal, we do a Fourier transform and we get um, a projection, the, the spatial projection, uh, and we use this to start to build up our MRI image. Okay, so uh, let's pop back to Fourier transforms quickly. So we've looked at Fourier transforms in a single direction. Um, we can do a two-dimensional Fourier transform. Uh, we're looking at an image. An image is uh, in two dimensions. So we can rewrite the Fourier transform uh, pair here. So rather than just doing a Fourier transform along X, we can also do a Fourier transform along Y, and then we have to do a double integral over both X and over Y, and then the frequency distribution that we get is also in two dimensions as well. So this is quite interesting from an imaging point of view, um, because we now can look at something called spatial frequency. So if we have our two-dimensional frequency space uh, as shown on the right here, we have in this case just two uh, red dots, the Fourier transform of that is going to give us the image on the left hand side here. Uh, and this is an image of two sine waves uh, effectively with the peaks being encoded as bright and the troughs being encoded as dark intensities. Or if our, uh, dimension, if our um, points in our frequency space are along the y-axis rather than along the x-axis, as in this case here, the Fourier transform, the two-dimensional Fourier transform, uh, gives us the uh, distribution, the spatial frequencies that we see on the left, lower left. So what distribution would give us this sort of uh, spatial frequencies? Well, we've got two dots here uh, uh, off axis. Uh, so we've now got our um, sinusoid uh, at 45 degrees. Uh, if we move our points further out in, in our frequency space, uh, this is gonna be higher frequencies. So our spatial frequency has a higher ripple to it as shown uh, the image of the lower left. Uh, so I know this is about medical imaging, but these, these examples show it quite nicely from a, a photograph. So we've got a photograph here of a, of a building and the Fourier transform of that tells us the frequencies that is in that, the image on the top here. Uh, so our zero frequencies are in the center and our higher frequencies are in the periphery. So of course, as soon as we've got that in the computer, we can say, okay, well, what does the frequencies uh, at the center uh, of our frequency space tell us around the zero point? And if we just do the Fourier transform, if we cut out the higher frequencies, just do the Fourier transform of the lower frequencies, we end up with the picture on the top here. And you can see this is a lower resolution image. 
um, is effectively a low pass. We've taken out all the high frequencies. If you remember at the beginning, I said high frequencies correspond to sharper edges. We've taken out the high frequencies, so we've taken the sharp edges out of our image. Uh, and just for fun, we could say well, what would happen if we took out the low frequencies uh, and just said, saw what information is in the higher frequencies. Uh, we do our two-dimensional Fourier transform and we get a picture of the edges, but we don't get a picture of the contrast. So there's no bright or dark information in there. Uh, we just get a picture of the edges. Uh, this is quite a nice example, uh, an image uh, from a, an early satellite going around the moon stitched together from lots of photographs. And you can see there's a, uh, a ripple in this image here, which is obviously not, not uh, what we want. Uh, so back in the 60s, they knew about, obviously, too much from Fourier transforms. They did the Fourier transform, and they saw that there's this periodic pattern uh, in the frequency space. Uh, and this periodic pattern uh, corresponds to the ripple uh, in the image. So they said, OK, let's put that in a computer. Let's take out those periodic dots. So we remove those peaks from the Fourier transform, from the frequency space. Uh, redo the Fourier transform and we end up with an image that's much improved with that ripple removed. So of course we can do that in MRI. Uh, so we do get uh, artifacts in MRI. Um, so one of those is called truncation artifacts. If we don't have enough uh, frequencies, so this is just reminding you that the higher frequencies correspond to the sharper edges. Um, if when we acquire the data for our MRI images, we do not have enough high frequencies, we get something called Gibbs ringing. So the uh, image top left is of a water bottle, and we've acquired this very quickly with not enough high frequencies uh, in, in our radio wave signal, and we get this ripple artifact at the edges. And if you could imagine drawing a line profile through uh, the image there, uh, the sort of ripples that you see are exactly what you'd expect when there's not enough high frequencies to fully fill in um, the peaks and the troughs. If we repeat the uh, MRI scan on the lower left here with a, a larger matrix size, we acquire higher frequencies um, and therefore we fill in a lot of that rippling and we get a much smoother image. So that's an example on a test object. Here's an example in a patient. Um, this is a, an axial slice through someone's brain. Um, and the brain, you can see the brain tissue is, is in the middle. The blood vessels are the bright uh, wormy things. And the skull doesn't have very much water in. So the skull is this black. Uh, line uh, around the edge of the brain. Uh, so at the boundary here, we're going from bright signal in the brain to dark signal uh, in the skull. Uh, if we don't have enough frequencies to uh, define that sharp edge, we're going to get ringing. And you can see this Gibbs ringing artifact with these ripples um, near the edge of the brain here. Uh, as we go further away from the boundary, we don't get the ripples deeper in the brain. So that tells us this is a, a Gibbs ringing artifact rather than a motion artifact. And finally, uh, sometimes we get things going wrong with our scanners, especially if we get sparks uh, from the uh, high voltage equipment in the scanner room. So this is an example of a frequency space uh, and the yellow arrow is pointing to a dot which shouldn't be there. So this is from a spark. It could be from a spark in an old filament light bulb uh, that's about to fail in the room. It could be a spark from some of the uh, connections in the scanner room. Uh, and we know sparks send out um, uh, a range of radio wave frequencies. Um, it's only happened very instantaneously um, for nanoseconds or so, but enough that it introduced uh, an erroneous um, radio wave signal into our frequency space, which shouldn't have been there. Of course, the scanner doesn't know that. It carries on running. It does the uh, Fourier transform to produce the image, and we get an image like this with this um, characteristic ripple artifact all the way through the image. Um, so uh, that's a direct uh, result of the use of the Fourier transform in MRI. Um, and just a take home lesson for when you uh, are in an MRI department, um, just to distinguish between these two artifacts. Uh, this artifact here is spiking case space. We have a regular ripple a reg uh, throughout the image, whereas the Gibbs ringing artifact that I showed you uh, it, it is also a ripple in the image, but it's not regular throughout the image. It's only at sharp boundary. So you have to find a sharp boundary. And if the ripple follows the sharp boundary, You've got a truncation artifact. If the ripple is constant throughout the image, you've probably got a spike artifact. Uh, and obviously from a medical physics point of view, if we're troubleshooting and trying to work out what's wrong with the scanner, uh, it's really good to know which one it is before we start taking the covers off, um, calling patients in and cancelling um, uh, patients. Okay, so I'm gonna tie up there. So just to remind you, 
we've touched on uh, how a Taylor series leads into a Fourier series, how that goes into a Fourier transform. Uh, and then I've talked about um, some applications in magnetic resonance imaging, in particular, how we spatially encode the image using frequency encoding. Uh, and then some of the wider digital imaging implications of the Fourier transform, um, in particular, uh, adding or removing higher or lower frequencies to improve the image or investigate image artifacts. So I'm going to stop there uh, and uh, hand back to you.